Good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, where you are. Welcome, everyone. I'm Carla Suarez Weiser, I'm the editor chief for Cochrane. And we have a webinar today uh, that, that will introduce some of the, the work we've done for the COVID-19 response, but also we have some guests, those uh, team members that participated in the review. Uh, we have Asger Sand uh, Muller from Denmark, Barbara Stroud from, from Austria, and Catherine Holton from Ireland. Uh, and uh, and we have I have my deputy Toby Lassison with me, and we we also have Sally Green. You hear from each one of them. Uh, but first, I would like to ask Chris Watts to give some uh, housekeeping, and we will then start the webinar. Thank you for your presence here. Thanks. Thanks, Carla. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Chris Watts. I'm the Learning Manager at uh, Cochrane Central Executive Team. Uh, I think many of you will be familiar with our Learning Live program. Um, same format here for how we're going to take questions. So Carla will be pausing to take questions between um, presentations during the webinar. Um, there's a couple of ways that you can do that. So uh, you can send us a question in this question panel here. Just type that in and that'll come to Carla so she can take, read when she pauses for questions. You can do that at any time. So just send those through uh, uh, as you wish. Um, or if you'd like to speak directly, um, then you can raise your hand. Um, I'll contact you if you've raised your hand and, and, and see the question, uh, talk to you about asking your question. Um, so that's how things are going to run from a questions perspective. Thanks. Thank you all very much. Um, so we have a, a quite a um, uh, full agenda today. We will start with a presentation about the, the, the process and how we got to the priorities. Then we have Toby Lasserson speaking about the giving an overview about the work that we've done, the editorial work in terms of draft reviews and special collections. We, as I said, we have three authors representing the author teams giving their own experience. And, and, and after that, Sally Green, the director of Cochrane Australia, uh, um, a, finalizing the, the, this webinar with her experience in Australia and, and how she made use of some of these, these uh, what we produced in, in, in the, for decisions in Australia. So I will start with, uh, with a presentation. Chris, if you can pass the next slide. And my first slide is just to say thank you. It has been an amazing experience and it has been uh, two months that actually changed our life. So a lot of people have been involved on in this process. People from the central team, people from the networks and cock and review groups, methods groups, centers and networks, consumers, all in all, this is a process that involved the whole cock and community. And I'm very, very grateful for the work of all of you. Um, Next, please. So this is a very full slide, but just to let you know that this, uh, the whole process is started on the second week of March and a lot has been accomplished. And we now uh, on the first week of June, but we you know we started uh, looking at priorities and how we would uh, create uh, together with the methods RAP review group, the guidance for RAP reviews, and how we would improve the, 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 the ability of supporting the production, fast track the publication on the second week of March. The third week of March, we went up uh, creating a working group because we understood that we needed members of the community. Um, but we also launched our uh, COVID rapid response site and we be began working on the priority reviews. The first priority review, it's one of the authors are in this uh, webinar this morning, was a quarantine review that was published in the first week of April. And that's when also we launched our registry of trials. And we started partnership and collaboration because we understood that there was quite a number of uh, people doing similar things and with the similar uh, agenda. Uh, and then we start engaging consumers and engaging with the World Health Organization uh, to provide support directly to the World Organization. And we created the question bank. So we started asking people for questions 
uh, that they felt that were relevant and I'll give you a little bit more of, of information about that. This question bank was quite successful and we went up with more than 250 questions. We then had to really create a process to prioritize these questions and, uh, and identify the areas that we would be in a better position to contribute and that's the work we're going uh, what we have planned for the next six months. Next slide, please. And uh, one of the things we had to do from the beginning is to identify how we support the production of these reviews. The first step was to maintain this question bank. So the question bank became uh, our direction of travel, but at some point it was clear that we needed to do some priority among the priorities. And uh, so we worked with uh, members of, of our team. We worked with coordinating editors of some group and with senior editors to identify the key questions. And then we uh, uh, organized these questions in a way that they would be uh, refined by, by the information specialists. So we identified groups, authors, that could, could uh, be able to, to deliver on the questions. And we provided support both in the, at the beginning of the process with information specialists, but during the process with methods expertise and clinical expertise. Uh, this process has evolved over the past six weeks. Next, next please. Um, uh, and, uh, and we then identified questions that were high priority for us and on, on which we would start by coordinating the team, the author team, provide the support and, provi and provide the fast track process. Next, please. Or uh, reviews that were in our target areas that I will discuss a little bit later, but they were not prioritized, the question has not been prioritized, and then these reviews could be submitted to the fast track. It can be submitted to the fast track. The fast track, the first point of the fast track is quality assurance. We are working on the possibility of uh, developing uh, of, of preprints, but we are, we are still looking at preprints in a way that is different of, of other areas because we want to have a quality assurance process before the preprint. So we're providing a, a initial decisions to the authors within the five days. This is then peer reviewed and our full process of fast track, and Tobu will speak more about that, it, uh, it, from the submission of the review to publication has been to the conducted in two to three weeks. Next, please. The other thing that we've done, it was to create a registry of, uh, of studies. And here I emphasize studies because our register is not based on reference, but the studies. I've done this slide on Friday and, and we had 6,361 studies in, the, in this register. And, now, and, and as of this morning, we are of 7,000. So it's, it's, it's updated daily. It's also annotated. So we, you can get the study type, the aim, the study design, and the intervention that had been assigned. We are working on PICO for the randomized control trials, but we also adding the type of reference. If it's a journal article, if it's a trial register, or if it's a preprint article. And this is important because there has been a very huge amount of, uh, of, of results presented as preprint, and uh, usually for systematic reviews. This is a good thing because you get access to the information beforehand, but also there is the, the possibility of this access, the, this information be less reliable. Next, please. And you can go a little bit faster because there is two arrows that I've already commented. Yeah. Um, so as a result of all of these, one of the things that we've done is to put together special collections. These special collections are tailored to, to areas that we felt that was important to support uh, especially the healthcare workers, uh, and they, they are freely available and they've been translated to more than 10 languages. Uh, we are, we're working on, on two other special collections and we're starting planning what are the special collections that would facilitate the, the, the work of healthcare workers uh, going forward. Next, please. And, and, and uh, we published so far five rapid reviews. You can go faster here, uh, Chris. 
Uh, and then some of these rapid reviews, you'll be hearing from them, uh, from the authors on this presentation. Please, next. Uh, and we start planning the areas of work going forward. I think it's fair to say that Cochrane is in a good place to respond to this demand. We always have been uh, emphasized the importance of keeping this evidence up to date. Uh, we have a community that has worldwide members with different expertise, and we are considered trusted source of evidence. So taking this into consideration, we started the, three weeks ago reflecting on what are the next phase of this process, because we believe that Cochrane is better positioned to support future outbreaks or to support the continuation of this of, of this outbreak, especially in low middle income countries. So we are working very close to the World Health Organization, and we, we are part of a, a network of, of a organizations called COVID and that has been led by John Laves and, and uh, Jeremy Grimshaw. And in fact, we have used their taxonomy to support the, the priority setting that we put together. We aim to focus on rapid reviews and living systematic reviews. We think it's very important to use our expertise in living systematic reviews because most of this process has evolved and is being uh, changing daily. And we will continue with fast track of priority reviews in the Cochrane Library. Next, please. So basically, those are the three key areas that we will be working on. Uh, clinical management, so this includes, and Tom will speak a little bit more about that, a series of reviews on diagnosed test accuracy, uh, some living systematic reviews in drug treatment, critical care and prophylaxis, but also some prognosis reviews and clinical management of pandemic-related impact on health. We're looking at public health measures, including questions related to the prevention of infection, personal protection, and the need to support healthcare workers. And we are working together with the CAMPO collaboration to produce reviews and economic and social response. So it's what we've, we've been approached by people. We, work at, uh, we then approach the camp and we're working with them to identify and refine the questions uh, and, it's, and then focus on social determinants of health and their impact on health outcomes. So I will stop here. I would like to ask Toby to give a brief presentation of, of, um, of the editorial process and then we'll open for questions after Tob and before we continue with the other um, uh, present presenters. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Um, thank you everybody for joining this morning as well. So as Carla was uh, very neatly describing, we've, we've uh, published a number of of uh, rapid reviews and uh, what we realized when uh, we start initiating this process is that we um, we obviously had to ensure that we could run a process that would uh, match the speed at which the reviews were being done and I know that um, Catherine who's going to be speaking about her qualitative evidence synthesis will be able to uh, describe the timelines uh, for that review in particular so um, when we um, when we started the, the process we started uh, to um, to move these reviews through uh, the uh, the editorial service uh, centrally, we realised that we um, we obviously had to work with the certain review groups. So we've partnered with a number of groups um, from the public health group, and also uh, we're looking to uh, partner with groups from out from other networks as well as um, as other priority topics come in. And um, when the uh, when the reviews are initially coming into us, we're um, uh, we're using the associate editors, which are part of my team, uh, to do a sort of a rapid QA on the review, quality assessment of the review. Um, and what we've also realised is that we, in order to, to sort of move these reviews along as, as quickly as possible, we need to balance uh, rigour with speed. I think it's probably one of the, the main uh, lessons for research, really, uh, during the pandemic, is the, the, the the trade-off that um, that might be happening um, in other parts of the world where research is being done, but we're we're taking an approach that I think um, um, stacks or or runs certain uh, processes in parallel, and I think it's the only way that we could we could really uh, turn around reviews in in that in this particular timeline. So after 
after sort of uh, the QA process, we then um, we then initiate copy editing uh, and peer review pretty much simultaneously. But we're we're obviously mindful that that peer review can lead to changes with the text of the review. So we we use the sort of the copy edit team to uh, work more on things like the tables and the references, the parts of the review that we know are likely to be stable, as stable as possible at least uh, over over time. That is buying us enough time. Um, to ensure that when the uh, referee comments come in, we have a, a pretty responsive pool of referees. I think um, the fact that people are available um, is, is, a, is, a, is a consequence of obviously the um, pandemic and the home working that um, we're, all, we're all subject to right now. Um, author teams have been incredibly responsive um, and um, they're turning around their sort of, their rebuttals and their process and their, their reviews within, within a few days. So we're able to get to the sort of the two, three week uh, timeline that Carla uh, described, largely through um, through the responsiveness of the referees, through the responsiveness of the authors, through the willingness of the groups who've been working with us. And um, also we've benefited from a lot from having sign off uh, from co-eds and also from members of the editorial board as well, the CRG uh, senior um, editors as well. So the sort of the collaborative approach, I think that's that's um, we've seen over the past few months has really helped us to ensure that uh, once we've identified a priority topic, um, once we have a team that we um, uh, we recognise is going to be able to fulfil that, and and um, it's one feature I think of of uh, the reviews that are being presented today is that the author teams are uh, not just um, very well skilled, but they're also very large. I think it's one of the um, one of the, the, the key learning points for me, I think, from the whole uh, pandemic is um, actually just how uh, how important that sort of that blend of, of methods and content expertise is, but actually how large these author teams tend to be in order to address these often quite complex uh, re review review questions. Um, so Carla also, I'll talk briefly about the DTA reviews. Um, so we've heard a bit about some of the intervention reviews and the qualitative evidence synthesis, but we've got six diagnostic test accuracy reviews as well. And we're now reaching a phase of the, of the pandemic, certainly in Europe, um, where uh, uh, the lockdowns are being eased. And part of that, that process of easing lockdowns involves um, contact tracing and testing. Um, so obviously the diagnostic test accuracy reviews that are coming through on things like lab and routine lab um, uh, tests and antibodies rapid point of care tests and also imaging for people in hospital. Um, there's obviously a, a, a re direct relevance of uh, a number of those reviews, not all of them, but a number of those reviews to the phase of the, the, the public health measures, the, the, uh, the phase of the pandemic and the public health measures that we're going to uh, see implemented over the next few months uh, to that. So, and they're going to be updated as, 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 uh, as frequently as possible. Um, as Carla said, the uh, the preprint servers are, um, are, are very enriched with uh, huge amounts of um, studies and data. Um, but the, the really sort of the really important strength that Cochrane is bringing to to all of this, I think, is um, our our experience in appraisal and appraising that evidence. And it's um, it's something that I think um, uh, will stand us in really good stead, not just for the next few months, but for uh, many beyond it. So um, if you're part of a group that's been helping us, thank you very much. If you're part of a group that I'm about to approach, please say yes uh, and partner with us. Uh, we'd love for you to be involved with this. And um, that's all I had. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Toby. Um, you will really receive uh, with this webinar all the slides and, and there, is, uh, there is a list of all the questions that we are dealing with so, so that you know. But now we will open. Uh, for questions, um, we'll be brief because so please, if you 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 can either write your questions on the chat box or you can hand, uh, hold your hand, and we'll be monitoring who are uh, who are asking questions, and then um, we we'll answer now one or two questions before we progress. But at the end, you also will have time to ask more questions if you want. Chris, I'm not seeing anyone um, asking any question, and I'm not seeing anything on the chat. Are you able to confirm yeah, that, that? That's right. No questions come through yet, Carla. 
All right, so for some of us, it's quite early in the morning, including myself. So <laughs> let's say, uh, you know, you still have, we'll have some opportunities to, to ask questions at the end of this uh, webinar. I want to move on and uh, ask Catherine Houghton to, to speak about her experience with the barriers and facilitator to healthcare workers at DIRIS Review. Um, and uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, I'll pass on to Catherine. And Catherine, please, if you can introduce yourself and the team and, and, and speak. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, my camera's a bit wonky. <laughs> I didn't get a chance to check it first. Um, hi, everybody. I've just been invited to speak briefly about um, my experience um, and the experience of the team in conducting a rapid qualitative evidence synthesis. Um, as you can see here from the question, it was quite broad in terms of healthcare workers' adherence with infection prevention and control guidelines for respiratory infectious diseases. So while this was conducted in response to COVID, um, it will have relevance um, with other respiratory infectious diseases. Um, next slide, please, Chris. Um, so we were invited to do this review um, just at a very early stage um, and we were given access to the protocol template. Um, however, some of the elements of that template were difficult for us in terms of qualitative synthesis. So we adopted the EPOC guidelines also um, and our review sat within the EPOC group. Um, and Claire Glenton um, is actually one of the co-authors due to the um, massive contribution she made during that time. Uh, next slide, Chris, please. So just briefly about what we did, um, there was a single Medline search, um, but also we did a citation chaining and a scoping search. So there was an additional over 1,500 screened outside of that Medline search. Um, while the, um, while the advice was to single screen with a percentage of double screening, we actually double screened all of the, um, the Medline search retrievals just because of the nature of qualitative um, uh, uh, papers and studies, it can, we just felt more comfortable doing it that way. We also agreed as a team, there was a core team of us that did all of these stages, that we wanted to get to know the evidence and wanted to get to know the studies from the early outset. And from that, we had um, 37 reports of 36 studies. Um, we made the decision to adopt a sampling frame at this stage just to make it more manageable within the kind of rapid process and it would also be um, acceptable within qualitative synthesis. So we wanted to make sure that we had a good geographical spread um, a representation from different countries and areas, but also to um, a spread of different respiratory infectious diseases as well, and also the depth of data that we could work with. Um, in terms of data extraction, I would ordinarily use NVivo or a similar kind of software management, but because we were at home, not everybody had access to that software. So we made the decision to use Google Forms, um, previously used by Andrew Booth actually, and that was a really um, intuitive way of us extracting the data. Um, in terms of synthesis approaches, um, for those familiar with qualitative synthesis, there's a number of different ways to analyze the data. We chose the best for fit framework approach because um, we had, during our scoping, we had identified a theoretical framework described by Moore in 2005 in relation to SARS. And this provided um, these three broad themes of organizational, environmental, and individual factors that can impact on adherence. So this provided a really good way for us to look at the data that we were that we had, which was sorry, um, uh, 21 reports of 20 studies following the sampling frame. Um, again, we assessed the methodological limitations of these studies in pairs. Again, just for us to really get to know the data in a short space of time and then we assess the confidence of findings um, using grade circle and um, that's very <laughs> a whistle stop tour of what we did the evidence summary and dissemination was really important and the epoch group were next slide please chris the epoch group, group um developed an evidence summary for us um, Evidence Synthesis Ireland developed an infographic and also, as Toby mentioned, or Carla mentioned earlier, podcasts 
uh, translations into different languages and presentations. We've done a few presentations already and we have um, uh, been reported in evidence aid as well. So a massive dissemination strategy once we had um, published. Next slide, please, Chris. So from a methodological perspective, did we make any compromises? Obviously, the single database search and um, the full evidence profile. So the grade circle um, assessment of confidence, we did that process, but the actual evidence profiles themselves just needed a little bit of tidying up. And we rather than, um, what, you know, waste time kind of doing that, we decided to add those in afterwards in what we have called stage two. Also we omitted the discussion. We wanted to present the evidence, um, but we did leave out the discussion at that stage. Again, we have since written the discussion and that is going to be in our stage two publication, which is currently in the editorial phase at the moment. Next slide, please, Chris. So we had a big team, but we had a small core team. So there was four of us that were engaging in the kind of groundwork or the, you know, rolling up our sleeves. But we also had an amazing group of experts, methodological and content, content experts that were available to us day and night. And I couldn't have thanked them more. The invaluable support of the EPOC group and the wider Cochrane community, as Toby mentioned earlier, uh, we had peer reviews come in over a weekend. Um, an Easter weekend um, and everybody was just on hand in terms of editors, copy editors, etc. The core team, we had to meet online all of the time and a lot of our discussions and things that we did were in real time over, you know, uh, video conferencing and we needed to kind of keep ourselves going and rally each other and there was a lot of um, goodwill and humour in that process as well. And the turnaround time was 23 days from when we were given the question to when we uh, to until when it was published that's um evidence of how everybody just threw themselves into this um ourselves but also cochrane and epoch and the peer reviewers and you know yeah it was a bit mind-blowing how uh, <laughs> how responsive and how wonderful everybody was and how supportive they were have any more slides i think that's it Oh yeah, just to um, hi, uh, just to if people were interested in finding out more about this review, um, myself and Linda, my one of the co-authors, we're delivering a webinar on the 18th of June. So that will be an hour long or similar uh, webinar where I'll be able to go into more detail. And that's me, I think. <laughs> Thank you very much, Catherine. As you say, um, and and this is something that has been from the beginning of this process. The spirit of collaboration is the only thing that made these things happen you know if you have to it's cooking on its best and i think we've seen it in a lot of experience and we're going from you to close to no it's not close it's speaking it's Oscar, okay. uh for the second review and you see again experience of this collaboration how the process we were uh, put in place Oscar is going to speak about his experience with the hand cleaning with wash for reducing spread viral and bacterial infections. Azure, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, is my webcam working or is it just a black screen? Or it's a black guys? screen. Yeah, that's not how I look. Um, I'm trying to, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure why it was working before, it's but. Fine. Uh, just yeah, I think I'll just, yeah, I'll just carry on. So hi everyone, I'm Asker from the Nordic Cochrane Center where I'm a PhD student um, and I was, I'm was i going to talk about the process of doing a rapid review on ASH as an alternative to soap for cleaning of hands. Um, I haven't done that many reviews but this was definitely the fastest I've done. We, uh, we were approached by Carla and some other people who told us that the WHO would like us to do this review and they would like it to be finished within seven days, as I recall was the deadline, uh, which was pretty crazy, but uh, but it was also very rewarding. So the way it worked was that we, we had a meeting with a lot of different people from Cochrane Central and then the group that I'm working with at the Nordic Cochrane Center where we discussed the topic, so some very brief discussions about which methods we would use. And then 
actually right after that we got started we were four people from the nordic cochrane center and then we were we don't have a search specialist at our center so cochrane was very helpful with getting us in contact with the uh, irma clearings from cochrane austria and she was able to do a full peer-reviewed search strategy and get us the results by the end of the day where we approached to the same day so i think that's also just very incredible that it, we were able to do it so fast uh, and then after we had the search i think my our experience mirrors catherine's to some extent that it's it's really a strong setup to have like a core relatively small core team that's working on on the issues and then like a, a network around that core team who can help clarify issues that are that are unclear because none of the people in our group were content area experts so we didn't really we know a lot about the systematic review methods but not so much about microbiology and how can we is this surrogate outcome good for this and then for those issues i think cochrane was very cochrane central was very helpful in like facilitating contact with content area experts who could clarify some of the issues we were unclear about um yeah like so like uh, like catherine's group we were also unable to work in the in the way we would usually do it because we had to be online but we used something similar to google forms microsoft's alternative to that and i think actually i think that's something we, we've learned that we might use more uh, later on because it was actually very although it has some drawbacks it was actually very intuitive to to be able to work in the same document and and do it like that uh, so we did the data extraction and the quality assessment and the synthesis of uh, of data uh, in four days and we submitted a review which was a draft of course because it hadn't gone through peer review but we submitted a review within after i think five days of the original question being asked and then we had a very uh, very good process with a, a network support fellow called rachel richardson who who gave us some really good feedback and we were able to substantially improve the draft we had from a, a draft to what was much closer to an final review within 24 hours because we just had it was such a good process where people reply quickly and and i can just imagine that from our part we don't really know what happens except because we were only in contact with rachel but it was pretty clear that she was in contact with a lot of people so i think that coordination was was quite impressive and uh, and it was just very it's a very rewarding process to actually make a a review that i think is quite good within uh, five six days and then to be able to get really really good feedback that then improves the review even more within just a couple of days um, and i i think we had the total time from so the the process here was a little different because the who wanted the review very quickly so we sent we did our draft and then like a first round of peer review so it was good enough to send to the who and then it went through and had a further round of peer review and i think we also had about 25 days from from we got the question to publication which is uh, it was very very tough because we had to work non-stop for a long uh, period of time but it was also just very rewarding to to be able to do something that that matters to a lot of people and that's actually quite good in a short period of time so i think uh, cochrane can be really proud of that uh, that achievement yeah i don't know if if any, yeah, if anyone has any questions i can maybe if i have a little more time maybe i can answer some questions or something thank you very much asger um yeah. any if question to asger you're still going to have the time after the third presentation to ask your question so if you have any question please use the chat box or hand hold your, uh, hand uh, open your hand and we'll go to you. Um, Asger, I'll move on to allow people, I, I don't see any question at the moment, no. but uh, yeah. people might want to ask questions and we'll, we'll, we'll pause after the third presentation. So the third cool. person to present today is Barbara. Uh, Barbara is uh, the first author of the quarantine review. But, uh, it has been a tremendous hard working and a tremendous success for Cochrane. It is the, the review that has been cited, uh, up, uh, up, uh, the, the full text have been, uh, the, the number of few, full text that has been uh, used 
is the highest number of full text in the whole Cochrane Library. So congratulations to Barbara. And uh, I think, um, you know, it, it, um, I'll let her speak for the process that they used and what the experience was. Thank you, Barbara. Yeah, thank you for the introduction and um, the invite. So I will briefly describe how we conducted um, this rapid review on quarantine measures. So we were contacted by the WHO in February to do such a rapid review and uh, we did it in one week. Then after a month they requested an update of this rapid review and this was the time when we got in contact with Cochrane and um, had the plan to publish it as a Cochrane review. And from the time where we did the second search to the publication, it was not even um, four weeks. So this was very rapid, like the other authors described. Um, I would like to highlight the differences from our rapid review to a normal Cochrane review, because we did some compromises to, to speed up the process. Um, we did uh, a lot of database searches. So we searched five databases and we also um, received the searches from the WHO because they provided us with records from daily Chinese database searches. So we had a comprehensive search, but in contrast to normal Cochrane reviews, we didn't have a specific gray literature search and we didn't contact the authors because we didn't have the time to wait for responses. Um, concerning the eligibility criteria, we had very broad eligibility criteria because we included all kinds of observational studies. Um, while normal Cochrane reviews usually focus on randomized controlled trials. But for this question of the effectiveness of quarantine, probably no randomized controlled trials would be available. And at this time of the pandemic, uh, we were eager to find any available evidence and would, we wanted to answer the question with the best available evidence, um, taking into account that probably this could also be just case studies or uh, modeling studies. We also implied language restrictions. Um, we focused on English and Chinese publications. This was um, okay back then in March because um, primarily COVID-19 was in place in China. But uh, if we would do this rapid review now, we wouldn't do a language restriction because apparently COVID-19 is um, all over the world now. And we can expect publications in all kinds of languages. Um, the study selection was similar to a normal Cochrane review except for the abstract screening because uh, we only screened 30% of the abstracts duly and the rest um, a single review. But we had a pilot exercise and we, had a, uh, we compared our uh, screening and we saw that we are all on the same page and we are all making very, very similar decisions. So we felt okay um, to do the rest of the screening singly. But the full text screening was done 100% duly. Concerning data extraction, risk of bias assessment, and grade, um, we did this duly, but we didn't do it independently. So one researcher of the team did data extraction and the second person checked it. Two people conducted risk of bias assessment and the third person checked it. And one person conducted the grade assessment and the second person checked it. So it was done duly, but not independently. And um, also organizational aspects were important to conduct this review in such a short time frame. As the other authors described, we had a very dedicated team that focused solely on this review and dedicated the weekends and the nights <laughs> to this review. Um, we also used parallelization of tasks. So we had a team of 10 people. And while some people were still doing abstract screening, a second part of the team was doing full text screening and a third part of the team was already doing data extraction. So this was all going in parallel. We used uh, software to support our task, um, Covidence for abstract and full text screening and Microsoft Teams to support the collaborative work and work on the same document. And we received support from WHO because they helped us to find um, people to translate the Chinese studies because we included um, studies in Chinese and none of our team was able to understand Chinese, but the WHO Collaborating Center in China translated them for us very quickly. And also Cochrane was very quick because the, the editorial process was uh, completed within two weeks. Peer review was um, done within 48 hours, which was just amazing, and everyone was very responsive. Um, 
Yeah, and as, as Carla already mentioned, the impact of this review was, was quite high. Um, there is the score measuring the attention of scientific papers, the altmetric score, and the one for our rapid review is 1,878 at the moment, and more than 100 news outlets worldwide picked, picked it up. The WHO used it for a policy paper, and it was tweeted about a thousand times, so it had quite an impact, and this was really rewarding for us because we, we put a lot of effort into it, but it's great to see that uh, it has an impact in the end. Thank you very much, Barbara. As you can see, I mean, from uh, from the three presenters, I think there are some things that is important to highlight. Uh, first of all, as we all discussed, the issue about uh, collaboration, we it, it was amazing, amazing. Centers, groups, uh, uh, consumers' participation on on peer review of these reviews, uh, method methods groups working together. So it's really an experience that is rewarding for us at the central level as well. But one of the things that I think I want to emphasize from the three presenters is the commitment of the author team. So we have we have gone to these rules of publishing rapid reviews. Um, it was a decision that was needed to be taken due to the the relevance of the rapid review methods. In, in to respond so rapidly to, but we didn't want to compromise in terms of quality of the evidence that we are producing. So I think one of the important things here is the organization of the teams and the commitment of the teams to produce in such a rapid. Uh, so we are very grateful for all the teams that worked with us. We have fantastic reviews and we are still carrying on all the reviews. I'd like to pause here to ask if anyone has any question. And while you're thinking, I do have a question for the three authors. Oh, I can see there is a question from Jody. Jody Doyle is asking, what will be the approach process for updating these reviews? Uh, you, you, just, uh, you just asked my question, Jody. <laughs> uh, once the COVID pandemic subsides, let's hope for it. Uh, does any one of the authors want to comment on, on updating of any of these reviews? Yeah, I can uh, I can comment on that. Uh, so in in our review, we we actually did a quite extensive search, but there were five uh, trials or studies that we couldn't access because they were not available online, and our our uh, research library was shut down because of uh, COVID. So we have these five trials that we're uh, we're trying to access, and we've uh, contacted authors, and we've try to get our library to look at it even though they're closed and and we definitely plan on when once we get those updating the review and getting it to the to a, become a normal review of like what you would uh, how you would call it um and i think uh, that was a, a big part of what we did was also to try to to not make the review too covid specific so it it's also relevant for other infections than just this and that I think it's also a good idea that that we put a lot of energy into this, so it's it's a good idea to make it. Uh, of course, it's a balance of of uh, being too broad, but uh, to consider is this something we can use after the pandemic, uh, hopefully ends. Yeah. Thank you very much, Asger. Um, Catherine and Barbara, do you want to comment on this question? So we. Hi. Sorry. You go first, Barbara. <laughs> we think it's important to do an update of our review because even within the short time of our first update, we found nine new studies. So there's probably a lot out there. But we have to uh, reorganize our team and discuss with uh, Cochrane and WHO the perfect timeline. The aim would be to do it over summer. Thank you, Barbara. Catherine? Just to echo what the others have said, really, is that we fully intend to do an update of the review with um, more databases included in this in in their search strategy, um, but also at a time when there will be more qualitative evidence in relation to COVID as well as other infectious diseases. Yeah, and one thing I want to add, 
is that we've been working very close to the tech team, uh, not only by the development of the register, but our goal is to support these reviews, the update of these reviews, uh, to be uh, conduct in a way that we provide, the, the, you know, that will be less time screening the, the, the literature. Uh, so one of the things that uh, we are testing now, Anna Noel is, is looking at testing uh, uh, the crowdsource uh and and be able to, but but also the register as i mentioned before the register that we put together the register of studies what facilitates and the reviews that needs to be updated will uh go into the front line in terms of uh, peak annotation and so we we will continue to provide support for these updates and we'll do our best to make these reviews now the decision where whether these reviews should be updated regularly or not it will very much depend on the question some of these questions are moving on and and are and they and also our focus is to be able to identify ways that we continue to support uh so the future in terms of you know i'd like to 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 see cochrane taking a major role on 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 supporting future pandemics or, or having a a, 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 a a number of reviews that will be able to provide the support um, Jody, I know you have uh, some other questions. Uh, I will go to Deborah due to time, and uh, if we have more time, I'll go back to your questions. Um, so Deborah is asking, uh, given the growth of the COVID register of his studies, did the authors consider the living systematic review approach? Any one of you would like to comment on that? So Deborah, uh, I will give a, a general comment that is that that's what we are moving on and discussing with each one of the author teams for questions that are relevant. Not all the questions will be suited to that. Uh, so we are really now identifying and going one to one with author teams that that we believe that the questions are relevant for living systematic reviews. So we have on the pipeline, for example, all the diagnostic test accuracy reviews will be living systematic reviews. We have two reviews, uh, prognosis reviews that we want to maintain as living systematic review, and obviously all the treatment reviews. We're working close to the to the Cochrane France, and and they've put together a number of authors, uh, a number of of uh, Cochrane groups all over the world, and they've already done that extraction and quality assessment of these studies and will then create a living network meta-analysis in treatment going forward so yes that's 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 i think an area that we very much want to be able to support and we also have been approached by other publishers and we are in, in collaboration with the the bmj at the moment to for a co-publication of a living systematic review um, due to the time, and if you have uh, questions, please continue to put your questions on the chat and we'll, <clears throat> we'll try to respond to that. But I'd like to introduce now Sally Green. Sally is the director of Cochrane Australia, the co-director of Cochrane Australia. And Sally is going to give an exper uh, her experience with uh, Cochrane uh, responding to the specific questions in Australia. Thank you, Sally. Thanks, Carla, and hi, everyone. Um, it's getting later in the evening here, so forgive me if I'm, um, if I'm a bit weary uh, coming in last, but um, I'm going to uh, present some of the work that we're doing here in Australia uh, as the Australian National COVID-19 Clinical Evidence Task Force. Um, and I'm really presenting this on, on behalf of, of many people at Cochrane Australia. The, the effort's been led by Julian Elliott and Britta Tendall and Rhianna and Tate on behalf of Cochrane Australia with work from the whole Cochrane Australia team. We, like, like the previous speakers, uh, really pivoted all the, everything that we were doing. We, turned our attention to uh, the massive challenge of COVID-19. So I know uh, some of those team members are on this call, in particular Miranda Cumston, Shauna Hurley, but the whole Cochrane Australia team, I, I feel a bit fraudulent presenting it on their behalf. I should have them all standing here behind me. Um, so the Australian National 
COVID-19 Clinical Task Force um, was funded or is funded by the Australian Government and Philanthropy. And it was a very rapidly put together um, response to the, the sort of catalyst of COVID-19. Um, sorry. Chris, could you please advance that slide? I'm clicking my mouse thinking, why is that not going forward? There we go. Um, so our purpose and scope is um, to provide a trusted, unified national clinical voice uh, to provide guidance and reassurance to Australian clinicians. And we've approached that by firstly, and, and really very importantly, bringing together a collaboration of major peak national clinical groups. So this is Cochrane Australia in partnership with many professional societies um, of clinicians and bringing to that rigorous evidence-based processes and keeping up to date with the latest research um, to, to bring about the guidance for our purpose and scope. Uh, importantly, the scope is in clinical care of people suspected or confirmed with COVID-19. Uh, it is not clinical care of other conditions in the era of COVID-19 uh, and it is not organisation of care uh, and it's not guidelines around the public health interventions that my colleagues previously have presented. But I will pause there from talking about these guidelines just to reflect on uh, the, the great importance uh, in, in my country, I'm sure in many others, but in, in my experience here of the reviews that have been presented uh, previously. Uh, in particular for us, the quarantine review and the PPE reviews were critically important, disseminated by us to government health services and um, many of our contacts, uh, Shauna Hurley, did a, a magnificent visual abstract of Barbara's quarantine review that was incredibly well received. Uh, and so we, um, we certainly can talk to the user end of, of how terrific it was to have those rapid reviews coming down the pipeline. Next one, thanks, Chris. Um, before I go on with the progress today, the, the other important point to pick up from the previous speakers and in particular from from the questions is that we really did see this as providing an opportunity to demonstrate uh, COVID-19, providing the opportunity to demonstrate the critical importance of living evidence, of living systematic reviews and living guidelines uh, in this very rapidly moving pandemic, uh, rapidly moving both in terms of, of tragically how rapidly the pandemic took hold across the world, but also in terms of the, the rapid onslaught of research. Uh, and so we've set these up from the outset as living guidelines underpinned by living systematic reviews reviews. Uh, the progress to date uh, is that we launched the guidelines on the 4th of April, which was two weeks after we established the task force and just before we were funded. Uh, we've done weekly updates since. Uh, we now have 28 national clinical member organisations working with us in partnership. Uh, we are running nine expert panel and leadership group meetings per week. We have five panels in um, sort of mild, moderate, severe and ICU critical uh, and then special panels to look at COVID-19 in pregnancy and perinatal care um, and another one um, around uh, palliative care I think. Um, 168 people contributing to the task force and to date we've had over 100,000 website hits. Uh, interestingly, 15% of those being not from in Australia uh, and over 5,000 downloads of our flowcharts. Next one, thanks, Chris. Uh, this is just a screen dump of the, the website um, and the web address for anyone who wants to have a look. It's all freely available. Um, the, the point that I particularly wanted to make here was on the uh, my far right, the dark green button around what further guidance is needed. It provides mechanism for people to suggest priority questions for the guidelines and also a, a 
sort of document that outlines all of the questions that have come in to date, including those that are out of scope for us. Uh, and I put that there to remind me to say that we are, or have been feeding those priority questions uh, into Cochrane's priority setting processes, but importantly also feeding Cochrane's priority questions back into our guideline panels so that we're trying to uh, leverage off those two activities. Um, and next one, thanks, Chris. Um, and just to finish, a few points around how uh, we were able to leverage and hopefully support some of Cochrane's activity just to demonstrate the collaboration. Uh, we, we couldn't have done this without coming from the platform of um, you know, the, uh, the great deal of work that's been done around living systematic review and living guideline methods. Um, but as I said, COVID-19 provided an incredibly strong case, probably the strongest we could have possibly imagined for the need of, of living approaches to reviews and guidelines. Uh, we're validating our inclusions and results and our risk of bias assessments against Cochrane France's magnificent uh, living map and network meta-analysis that Carla referred to already. Uh, we are making great use of Cochrane's COVID-19 study register and, and um, Steve McDonald, our search specialist, has been working with that team around making sure that there's two-way flow. Um, and as I've said, our approach is the weekly updates to maintain our included recommendations, plus weekly processes with the panels to add new priority questions, uh, and then communication of these priorities to Cochrane and Cochrane priorities to our panels. Thanks, Chris. And I think that's where I'll stop. So happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Sadi. Any questions for Sadi? So as we approach the end of this webinar, while you're thinking about your questions, I want to, to thank all of the presenters, but also emphasize the importance of, uh, of, uh, of the collaboration that went through this process. And I hope you've seen some of these during this webinar. Uh, we continue to work on the next phase of this process and we want to be sure that uh, that you your voice is, is, is heard. So please contact us and, and, uh, and let us know if you have anything or any questions or any other thing that you'd like to, to work with us on it. And uh, I wish you all well. I hope you were well. I hope that uh, the isolation is not taking such a hard time in all of us and, uh, and that we'll soon be able to meet again. Thank you very much. And please be in touch if you have anything that you'd like to discuss. Bye-bye.